Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, taking off into the essential world of basic aerodynamics. Yeah, we're aiming to keep it clear, right? Not getting too bogged down in the heavy math. Exactly. Our goal is to pull out those core ideas that explain how airplanes actually fly. Think of it as uh, your quick guide to flight essentials. And we're using a really solid source for this. Mm -hmm. Ease of Part 66, Module 8, Basic Aerodynamics. It's what maintenance techs use, so it's grounded in you know, practical stuff. Right, keeping them flying. Mm -hmm. So our mission today is pretty straightforward. Grab the key concepts from the early parts, really focusing on the atmosphere and the basic forces on the plane. Sounds good. Where should we start? Maybe the air itself. Perfect. Let's yeah. look at the atmosphere. The document says it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen, but the key for flight is that air is a compressible fluid. That's the crucial bit, yes. Unlike water, you can squeeze air, change its density, Think about uh, pumping up a bike tire. That's compressibility in action. Okay, and that compressibility leads us straight to atmospheric pressure. That's just the weight of all the air stacked above us pushing down, right? Exactly. Now. Force per unit area. At sea level, it averages out to about 14.7 pounds on every square inch. 14.7 PSI. Yep, or you'll often see it as 1013.2 hectopascals or millibars. Same thing, different units. There are others like inches of mercury, but those two are probably the most common you'll encounter. Okay, so this pressure is everywhere at sea level. But what happens when a plane climbs? That column of air above gets shorter, doesn't it? You got it. Less air above means less weight pushing down, so the atmospheric pressure decreases as you go up. And the document has a figure showing that drop. Yeah, figure one to four. It really shows how steeply it falls off, especially yeah. once you get up towards, say, 50,000 feet. The pressure up there is just a tiny fraction of sea level pressure. Makes total sense. Less air, less pressure. How does that directly hit the aircraft, though? Well, uh, two main ways. Less pressure means the air is thinner, less dense. So the wings have less stuff to push against to make lift. Yeah. The engines. They get less oxygen to burn, which means less power, less horsepower. It's kind of a double hit on performance as you climb higher. Right. Lift and power are both affected. Now, density. The doc defines it as weight per unit volume. How does that connect to pressure? They're directly linked. If you take the same amount of air and squeeze it into a smaller space, increase the pressure, it gets denser. Simple as that. So higher altitude means lower pressure and lower density. Correct. What about humidity? That one feels a bit less intuitive. How does water vapor affect air density? Yeah, it's interesting. Humidity is just the amount of water vapor in the air. <laughs> and uh, counterintuitively, more humid air is actually less dense, assuming temperature and pressure stay the same. And less dense. Why is that? Because water vapor molecules, H2O, are actually lighter than the main components of dry air, which are nitrogen N2 and oxygen O2. So if you replace some N2 and O2 molecules with lighter H2O molecules, the overall density goes down. Huh. So damp days mean less dense air. Exactly. And that's why aircraft often need longer runways for takeoff on humid days. Less dense air means less lift and less engine power, just like high altitude or high temperature. It's a real factor. Wow. Okay. Definitely something to remember. So we've got pressure, density, humidity. What about temperature? It gets colder as you go up, right? Oh, yeah. In the troposphere, which is where most civilian flying happens, the temperature drops pretty consistently. It's about 2 degrees Celsius or uh, 3.5 Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet you climb. That's the layer closest to the ground. Right. Then you hit the tropopause, the sort of boundary layer where the temperature levels off for a bit. It's really cold up there, like minus 57 Celsius, roughly. Brr. And above that... Above, that's the stratosphere. Yeah. And weirdly, the temperature actually starts to increase again as you go higher in the stratosphere. So military jets and uh, specialized flights go up there. Mm. It's also where the ozone layer lives. Figure one to six shows these layers quite nicely. Okay, so cold up high. But you mentioned hot days affect takeoff too. Why is warm air bad for performance? It comes back to density again. Warmer air is less dense than cooler air, all else being equal. Ah, oh, right. So just like with humidity or high altitude, on a hot day, the engines get less dense air, meaning less oxygen for combustion, so that's power. And the wings get less dense air to work with, meaning less lift at the same speed. So yeah, hot days mean worse takeoff performance. It's all interconnected. Pressure, temperature, humidity, all feeding into density. Precisely. Which brings us to the International Standard Atmosphere, or ISA. You see that mentioned a lot. Yeah, what's the point of the ISA if the real atmosphere is always changing? Well, that's exactly why we need it, because the real atmosphere is always changing. The ISA is a kind of idealized average model of the atmosphere 
Think of it as a fixed benchmark. A standard ruler to measure against? Exactly. It's defined by bodies like ICO and ISO. It gives everyone, designers, engineers, pilots, a common reference point for calculations, for comparing aircraft performance, and really importantly, for calibrating flight instruments so they read consistently worldwide. Makes sense. So it provides standard values for pressure, temperature, density at different altitudes. Yep. Figure 1 to 7 in the source lays out those key values. Altitude, temperature, and CNF pressure in CI and HPA, density, all tabulated for standard sea level, 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, right up the scale. Super useful reference. Okay, quick recap then. The big four factors affecting the atmosphere are pressure, density, temperature, and humidity. Got it. ICAO sets the standards for studying it. Right. And the best conditions for aircraft performance are cold, dry days at low altitude because the air is densest then. You nailed it. And if it's, say, 20 degrees Celsius at sea level, mm. it'd be roughly minus 40 C, way up at 30,000 feet. Yeah, that's the right ballpark based on that standard lapse rate. Oh, and the instrument for measuring pressure. The barometer. The barometer. And mm. most flying we do is in that first layer, the troposphere. Okay. Atmosphere basics covered. Now let's get into the aero part, how planes actually generate the forces needed to fly. Right, aerodynamics. Basically, it's the study of how air moves and interacts with objects moving through it, like uh, how air flows around a wing. And the document talks about relative wind. That sounds important. It is. Relative wind is just the airflow direction as the aircraft sees it. It doesn't matter if the plane is moving through still air or if the wind is blowing past a parked plane. The relative wind is the air hitting the plane, opposite its direction of travel through the air. Got it. It's relative to the aircraft. And speed versus velocity, there's a difference. A small but important one, speed is just how fast, like 300 miles per hour. Velocity adds direction 300 miles per hour north. That direction matters a lot in aerodynamics. Okay. Now, the big one, lift. How does that wing shape actually make an aircraft fly? Ah, uh, the magic. It's all about the airfoil shape and Bernoulli's principle. Yeah. The top surface of a typical wing is curved more than the bottom. Right. So the air flowing over the top has to travel further and faster than the air flowing underneath to meet up again at the back edge. Okay, faster on top. And Bernoulli figured out that faster moving fluid and air is a fluid has lower pressure. So you get lower pressure on top of the wing, higher pressure underneath. And that difference pushes the wing up. Exactly. It creates a net upward force lift. And it's significant. The source says about three quarters of a lift comes from that low pressure on top, sucking the wing up, and only about a quarter from the higher pressure pushing up from below. Figure 2-2 shows this really well with streamlines and pressure arrows. So it's mostly suction from the top, not just air hitting the bottom. That's a common misconception, isn't it? It really is. The shape is engineered to create that low pressure zone above. OK, lift explained. What about upwash and downwash? As the wing moves through the air, it deflects the airflow. Upwash is the air being deflected slightly upwards, just ahead of the wing's leading edge. Uh -huh. Downwash is the air being pushed downwards behind the wing's trailing edge. This turning of the air is fundamentally linked to generating that pressure difference and thus the lift. Figure 2-3 illustrates it. So the wing is actively pushing air down behind it and free stream flow. That's just the air that's far enough away from the aircraft that it hasn't been disturbed yet. The air the plane is flying into, essentially. Right, undisturbed air. Now, right next to the wing surface, there's the boundary layer. Laminar and turbulent flow happen here. Correct. Right near the front, the leading edge, if the surface is smooth, you get laminar flow. The air moves in nice, smooth, parallel layers. Think of it like uh, cards sliding over each other smoothly. Okay, very orderly. But as the air flows further back, that laminar flow tends to become unstable and transitions into turbulent flow. That's where the air gets all mixed up, chaotic swirling eddies. Like cigarette smoke starts smooth and gets turbulent. So smooth versus chaotic, is one better than the other? Well, laminar flow creates less skin friction drag, which is good. Mm -hmm. But turbulent flow actually tends to stick to the wing surface better at higher angles of attack, which can delay a stall. So it's a bit of a trade-off. And that transition to turbulent flow is pretty much inevitable further back on the wing. Interesting. Okay, now thinking about the whole wing, the 3D shape, the doc mentions wingtip vortices. Ah, uh, yes, vortices. Because you have that high pressure under the wing and low pressure on top, the air under the wing wants to escape out towards the wingtip 
and then curl up around to the low pressure area on top. It spills over the edge. Sort of, yeah. It creates these swirling masses of air, like mini horizontal tornadoes, trailing from the wingtips. You can see them illustrated in figure 226. And these cause drag. They do. This is called induced drag, and it's an unavoidable consequence of generating lift. And you mentioned wake turbulence earlier. Right, the danger to following planes. That's these wingtip vortices. They can be really powerful, especially from large aircraft, which is why separation rules are so important. Got it. Vortices equal induced drag and wake turbulence. Now some specific airfoil terms. Camber, cord. Can you break those down? Sure. Camber is basically the curve of the airfoil. More specifically, it's the curvature of the line halfway between the upper and lower surfaces. Okay, the overall curve. Cord, or cord line is simpler. It's just a straight line drawn from the very front edge, the leading edge, to the very back edge, the trailing edge. Figure 2-9 shows this. Leading edge to trailing edge. Got it. Then there's mean aerodynamic cord, which is a kind of average cord length used for calculations on complex wing shapes. And maximum thickness is just, well, the thickest part of the airfoil. And camber is key for lift, right? Because it makes the air go faster over the top. Precisely. That curvature forces the air to accelerate. Figure 210 shows the airflow. And you'll see different airfoil shapes, different cambers designed for different flight speeds, subsonic versus supersonic, as shown in figure 211. Okay. What about wash in and wash out? They sound like laundry terms. Huh. No, they refer to twisting the wing slightly along its length. Washout is the common one. It means the wing root, where it joins the fuselage, is mounted at a slightly higher angle of incidence than the wing tip. Higher angle at the root? Why do that? It's a great safety feature. It makes the wing root stall before the wing tip if the pilot pulls the nose up too high. Ah, so the tips keep flying longer. Exactly. And the ailerons, which control roll, are out near the tips. So keeping the tips flying means you maintain roll control even when part of the wing is starting to stall. Fi Figure 212 shows this twist. Washing is the opposite, less common. Clever design. Okay, fundamental forces, time. Thrust, weight, lift, and drag. The big four. Mm -hmm. Thrust from the engines pushes forward. Weight from gravity pulls down. Lift from the wings pushes up. And drag resists the motion, pulling back. And in steady flight, they're all balanced. In straight and level flight, at a constant speed, yes. They're all in equilibrium. Figure 213 shows that balance. And the aerodynamic resultant, what's that? That's just the single force you'd get if you combine the lift and drag forces together. It's shown in figure 214, useful for some analysis. Okay, now angle of attack, or AOA, super important, right? How is it different from angle of incidence? Crucially different. Angle of incidence is fixed. It's the angle of the wing is bolted onto the fuselage part of the design. Okay, fixed angle. Angle of attack, AOA, is dynamic. It's the angle between the wing's cord line and the direction the air is actually hitting it, it, the relative wind. This angle changes constantly as the pilot maneuvers the aircraft. See figures 2.8 and 2.16. So AOA changes with flight path and attitude. Incidence doesn't. You got it. An AOA is the primary control the pilot has over how much lift the wing generates at a given airspeed. Right. Now, lift and drag coefficients, CL and CAD, these sound like math terms. They are, but they're super useful. They're dimensionless numbers that basically bundle up all the complex factors affecting lift and drag wing shape, area, AOA, air density, speed into one value for lift, CL, and one for drag, CD. They let engineers predict performance. So they quantify lift and drag potential. In a nutshell, yes. Sorry, a and an important point is that the drag coefficient CED generally goes up as the angle of attack goes up. More AOA, more lift, but also usually more drag. Generally, yes. Lift increases at AOA, but only up to a point. That's the critical angle of attack, or stall angle. The stall angle, what happens there? Beyond that angle, the airflow can't follow the sharp curve over the top of the wing anymore. It separates becomes turbulent and detached. That's called the burble point. And lift just disappears. It decreases dramatically and drag shoots way up. Yeah. The wing stalls. Definitely not a situation you want to be in unintentionally. No kidding. Okay, what about the center of pressure, the CP? The doc says it moves. It does. The CP is the single point on the wing's cord line where you can consider the total aerodynamic force, lift and drag combined, to be acting. Okay. And its location isn't fixed. As you increase the angle of attack, the CP typically moves forward along the cord. As you decrease AOA, it moves backward. This movement, as figure 217 notes, can make the aircraft unstable if not accounted for in the design. Unstable, right. Now, the lift-to-drag ratio, L over D, that sounds like an efficiency rating. It is exactly that. LD ratio is a key measure of how aerodynamically efficient a wing is. 
higher LD means more lift for less drag. Hmm. Very desirable for range and fuel economy. And it changes with AOA. Yes, there's a specific angle of attack where the LD ratio is at its maximum. That's the wing's most efficient point. Okay, efficiency peak. Finally, let's break down the different kinds of drag. There's parasitic, induced. Right. Parasitic drag is basically everything that's not directly related to producing lift. It's just the resistance of the aircraft moving through the air. Like air resistance on a car. Pretty much. It has a few parts. There's form drag, caused by the shape of the abduct. A blunt shape causes more flow separation and a bigger turbulent wake behind it, hence more drag than a streamlined shape. Mm -hmm. Think of a flat plate versus an airfoil, like in figure 218. Shape matters. Definitely. Then there's friction drag or skin friction. That's literally the air rubbing against the surface of the aircraft within that boundary layer. Rough surfaces, rivets sticking out, they all increase friction drag. So smooth surfaces are key. Absolutely. Smooth paint, flush rivets, keeping the surfaces clean all help reduce skin friction. And the last type of parasitic drag. Interference drag. This happens where different parts of the aircraft meet, like where the wings join the fuselage or the tail joins the body. The airflows interfere with each other, causing extra drag. PQ219 shows an example. Okay, so form, friction, interference, that's parasitic drag. And induced drag, just to recap. Induced drag is the drag that is directly related to producing lift. It's caused by those wingtip vortices we talked about, the swirling air from the pressure difference. The price you pay for lift. Essentially, yes. Wings with a high aspect ratio, long and skinny wings, tend to have lower induced drag. And wave drag, when does that show up? That's really only a factor of very high speeds around the speed of sound transonic and sutrasonic flight. Shock waves form on the aircraft, and creating those shock waves takes energy, which shows up as a significant drag increase. We'll see that in figures 310 and 311 later. Okay, high speed stuff. One last really critical point. Aerodynamic contamination. Ice, snow, frost. Hugely critical. Any contamination on the wing, especially the leading edge, mm. can be incredibly dangerous. Even a thin layer of frost, something that looks harmless, yeah. it completely disrupts that smooth airflow we need for lift. It roughens the surface, changes the airfoil shape slightly, and can cause the wing to stall at a much lower angle of attack and a higher speed than normal. Wow. It drastically reduces lift and increases drag. That's why removing all traces of ice, snow, or frost before flight is absolutely non-negotiable. It's a fundamental safety rule. It's amazing how something seemingly so small, like a bit of frost, can have such a massive impact on flight. Just shows how complex and interconnected all these factors are. Absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground today. From the basic properties of the air around us to the fundamental forces and principles, lift, drag, AOA, that make flight possible. It really lays the groundwork for understanding more complex things later on. It really does, and it makes you think, if a thin layer of frost can be so critical, what other, maybe less obvious, small factors could have really significant impacts on aircraft performance or safety? Something for you, the listener, to perhaps ponder on your own. A great thought to end on. There's always more beneath the surface in aviation. Indeed. Thanks for taking this deep dive with us today.